The deadlift is often referred to as the king of all lifts, and for good reason. As you'll see in this video, the deadlift works almost every single muscle in the entire body, and if performed correctly, has been proven to yield an incredible number of benefits. However, deadlifting is also one of the most common ways that people injure themselves, and because it is so complex and involves the entire body, it is absolutely essential that you start with a comprehensive understanding of exactly which muscles are being targeted, including how and why they're being worked, and whether they are a primary agonist, secondary agonist or stabilizing muscle and whether you're positioning yourself correctly to hit them because then you'll also be able to apply that knowledge to make slight variations in your form in order to place more or less load on any particular muscle. To break down deadlift anatomy we're going to use the two most common deadlift variations the classic deadlift and the stiff leg deadlift. The difference being that with the stiff leg deadlift you bend much less at the knees keeping your hips higher and your back drops down to a much lower angle. And we'll go over these differences and their effects on how we each muscle has worked throughout the video. Since the hips are such a pivotal part of the deadlift, we'll start by looking there. Any deadlift variation will require hip extension, or straightening the body at the hips. And the most powerful hip extensor we have is the gluteus maximus, making it a primary target of any deadlift variation. The gluteus maximus originates along the back of the pelvis or hip bone and travels down and out to insert on the back of the femur or thigh bone. So when it contracts, it brings the back of your hips and the back of your upper leg closer together, which straightens the hips. The gluteus maximus also performs posterior pelvic tilt, which you use to rotate your hips forward at the top in a full range of motion deadlift, making it a primary target via a second movement. And in general, the more movements a muscle performs in an exercise, the harder it gets worked. However, to get the full picture of how the gluteus maximus is worked in the deadlift, we also have to understand that there are actually two different types of hip extension and they work the gluteus maximus differently. The first is where the legs are fixed and it's the back that's moving and that has been proven to work the upper region of gluteus maximus more than the lower. And the second is where the back is fixed and it's the legs that are moving and that works the lower region of gluteus maximus more. Now, why is that important? Well, because in the stiff leg variation of the deadlift, your legs are mostly fixed and your back is doing all the extending. So it's going to work the upper gluteus maximus the most. While in the classic variation, you're doing an even mix of both types. So it will work the upper and lower regions equally. Just the first example of why fully understanding the anatomy behind the exercise can make such a big difference in your training. Another group of muscles that perform hip extension are the hamstrings, or the muscles that make up the underside of the thigh. However, whether the hamstrings are primary or secondary targets in the deadlift depends on how you do it. What we call the hamstrings are really three different muscles. The semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris. They all cross the back of the knee, so when they contract, they flex or bend the knee. However, they also cross the back of the hip joint, with origination points on the back of the pelvis. So they also pull the back of the leg and the back of the pelvis closer together, straightening the hips. And it's this fact that the hamstrings cross both joints that makes it an interesting case with the deadlift. When the knee is bent, it essentially creates slack in the bottom of the hamstrings, and that makes them unable to exert as much force into straightening the hips. You can also think of it as the bottom of the hamstrings are being stretched while the top of the hamstrings are trying to contract. So how well the deadlift works the hamstrings depends on how much the knees are bent. In the stiff leg variation, that's very little, so the hamstrings are able to put a significant amount of force into straightening the hips, therefore they are a primary target. However, in the classic deadlift, there's a lot more knee bending going on, and that creates that slack in the hamstrings, therefore the hamstrings are bumped down to just secondary agonists in that variation. So if you want to target your hamstrings more or less while deadlifting, simply adjust how much you are bending your knees. Next is the adductor magnus, which is a very large muscle that makes up the majority of your inner thigh and actually is hit in two different directions by the deadlift. First, when the hips are bent like they are at the beginning of a deadlift, the origination point of adductor magnus on the pelvis is behind its insertion point on the inside of the femur. So it pulls the upper leg back, straightening the hips making it a primary agonist. But it also gets worked as an adductor. It's in the name, right? Adductor magnus. Adduction means to bring the leg towards the middle of the body, and that is required to stabilize the hips and keep the knees from flaring out during the deadlift. So the adductor magnus is also a stabilizing muscle in that respect, as are all the other muscles that adduct the leg, which I'll list here, but we won't go over in detail. On top of that, when the body really wants to stabilize a muscle, it does something called antagonistic coactivation, meaning that it activates muscles on both sides of the joint to keep it stable. So the abductors are also activated in the deadlift. Abduction means to bring the leg away from the body, and those muscles are the tensor fasciae lata, 
gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and gluteus maximus again, particularly the upper region. All four have origination points along the side of the pelvis and insert down on the lateral side of the leg, so when they contract, they pull the leg out, or in this case, keep the legs from buckling inwards, making them all stabilizers in the deadlift. As another example of how to apply this knowledge, let's say you really wanted to emphasize your butt during the deadlift. All you would have to do is place a resistance band around your legs just above the knees, which would add extra resistance against abduction, turning all three glute muscles into primary agonists. The next deadlift motion we'll look at is knee extension, performed exclusively by the quadriceps or quads, but whether the quads are primary targets or not, once again, depends. The quads are made up of four different muscles, the vastus lateralis, medialis, and intermedius, as well as the rectus femoris. All four muscles cross the top of the knee, so they straighten the knee when they contract. However, the important difference here is that unlike the other three muscles, rectus femoris also crosses the front of the hip. So rectus femoris contraction also bends the body forward at the hip. And this is really important for the same reason that knowing that the hamstrings crossed two joints was really important. When the hip is in a bent position like it is at the beginning of the deadlift, that creates slack in the rectus femoris and makes it unable to exert as much force into straightening the knee. The top is being stretched while the bottom is trying to contract. So the rectus femoris, which is actually the largest of all the quad muscles, is just a secondary target in the deadlift. But since the other three quad muscles only cross the knee, all that matters is how much knee bending is going on. In the classic deadlift, that's a lot. So those three muscles are primary targets. But with the stiff leg version, there's much less knee straightening required. So they're likely a secondary target in that variation. Now let's take a look at the ankles. At the beginning of a deadlift, your ankle is dorsiflexed, which means the foot is pointed up towards the shin. And as you perform the deadlift, you straighten out that ankle, which requires plantar flexion. The two main plantar flexors of the ankle are the gastrocnemius, which lies on the surface, and the soleus, which is underneath. Both cross the back of the ankle via the Achilles tendon to insert on the heel, so when they contract, they pull up on the heel, which plantar flexes the foot. However, while the soleus originates on the tibia and fibula, the gastrocnemius actually crosses the back of the knee as well, originating from the back of the femur in the upper leg, so the gastrocnemius also bends the knee joint. So, just like the hamstrings, having the knee in a bent position at the beginning of the deadlift actually creates slack in the gastrocnemius muscle, making it unable to exert as much force in straightening or plantar flexing the foot. So, how much does the deadlift work your calves? Well, once again, it depends. With the stiff leg variation, there's not a whole lot of straightening of the ankle required, so both muscles are just stabilizers. With the classic variation, there's much more straightening of the ankle required, so the soleus gets bumped up to a secondary target, while the gastroc still is a stabilizer. However, there's a caveat here. If you're using a barbell, that places your center of gravity farther out in front of your body, which shifts more weight onto the balls of your feet and your toes. That would bump the soleus up to a primary target and the gastrocnemius up to a secondary. It would also activate the toe flexors, making them at least stabilizing muscles. So what equipment you're using also can make a difference on how each of the muscles in the body is worked. Now let's look at the back, starting with the erector spinae, which is a group of three long muscles that line either side of the spine, the iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. They have origination and insertion points along the back of the vertebrae and ribs, so when they contract, they extend the spine, straightening the back. Now, important point here, which I will go over in more detail in a part two of this video dedicated to deadlift form, but it is extremely important to keep your back straight through the deadlift. I highly recommend using a lifting belt, which have been proven to drastically reduce the risk of injury by protecting and stabilizing the spine, while also significantly enhancing performance. I personally use this one by Pro Fitness whenever I'm lifting heavy weight, and I'll put a link to it in the video description along with a 10% off code that they provided for my viewers. But why am I saying this now? Well, because if you had perfect form, all three of the erector spinae muscles would be stabilizers, contracting isometrically to keep your back straight, but in reality, perfect form does not happen. No matter how good you are, there will be slight variations in the flexion and extension of your spine through the lift, which makes the erector spinae muscles at least secondary targets with how hard they have to work to keep your back and spine straight, particularly if you're not using a lifting belt. Two more things that your back muscles need to do in a deadlift are one, keep your shoulders back via scapular retraction, then two, take your arms from out in front of your body 
and pull them back to a neutral position, which is called shoulder extension. The muscles that retract your scapula are the rhomboid major and minor and the middle and lower heads of the trapezius, all of which originate from along the spine and then insert on the medial border of the scapula, pulling them back and in. And the muscles that pull your arms back are the latissimus dorsi, the teres major, the posterior deltoid, and the long head of the triceps. All these muscles originate from locations on your back and then insert on the back of the upper arm, so when they contract, they pull it back. In the classic deadlift, you're not bending that far forward and your arms don't go as far out in front of your body, so the shoulder retractors and extensors will all function as secondary targets. However, with the stiff leg version, your arms begin much farther out in front of your body. And with your upper body much closer to horizontal, gravity is working much more directly against both shoulder retraction and extension, so those same muscles will be bumped up to primary targets. But whatever amount of weight is placed on scapular retraction, more is placed on scapular elevation, because while your back is straight or anywhere close to it, all of the weight is pulling down on the shoulders. So the muscles that keep your shoulders up are working very hard. Those are the upper trapezius and levator scapulae. These muscles originate from around the base of the skull and the cervical vertebrae in the neck and travel down to insert on the top of the scapula. So when they contract, they pull the shoulders upwards or keep them from being pulled down. So again, with the amount of weight that is pulling down on the shoulders, these muscles are primary targets of the deadlift. Now, even though the long head of the triceps is the only one that extends the arm, all three tricep heads are required to keep the elbow straight during the deadlift motion and stabilize that joint. And remember, when your body really wants to stabilize a joint, it will apply antagonistic coactivation. So the elbow flexors are also going to be activated in order to stabilize the elbow joint. That includes both heads of the biceps, the brachialis, and brachioradialis. And the elbow flexors are activated even more if you are holding the weight in a supinated grip with your palms facing forward. And that brings us to the forearms. And I found that most people severely underestimate the role of the forearms in exercises like the deadlift. If your forearms can't handle the weight, nothing else in the body gets worked. And for the vast majority of people, your forearms will give out much sooner than your more powerful back, leg, and upper body muscles will, which means that your forearms are actually the limiting factor in how much weight you can deadlift, unless you are using a grip assist device that allows you to bypass grip strength limitations. And I'll go over that more here in a second. But first, what are the forearm muscles that are worked in the deadlift? Well, there are two main categories of forearm muscles, the flexors, which are found in the underside of the forearm, and their extensors, which are found on the top side of the forearm. And grip strength comes from a combination of both. Now, because the forearm muscles are so complex and there's so many of them, I'll just list them here and we'll simply refer to them collectively as the forearm flexors and extensors. So if you're not using wrist straps, then the forearms are very much primary targets of the deadlift. If you are, they can be bumped down to a secondary or even stabilizing muscles. I highly recommend using wrist straps when you deadlift. They've been proven to enhance not only grip strength and security, but recovery, power, and performance. I'll put a link in the video description to the wrist straps that I recommend. They have wrist padding and support in addition to the grip assist function. They're made by Pro Fitness and are the ones that I've personally been using for years without being paid to do so. But back to deadlift anatomy, there is one more group of muscles for us to hit, and that is the muscles of the core, including the rectus abdominis or abs, the internal and external obliques, and the transverse abdominis, which lies beneath the rest and has fibers that run horizontally across the body. Because of that, when the transverse abdominis contracts, it increases intra-abdominal pressure, which supports and protects your body from injury due to external pressure, like when you bend down in a deadlift and exert yourself to try and pull that weight up. The abs and obliques also help provide some of that support and pressure, so they are stabilizing muscles in this lift. However, the majority of it comes from the transverse abdominis, making it at least a secondary target of the deadlift. So now we can see why the deadlift has a legitimate claim to the title of king of all lifts. It works virtually every single muscle in the body. In fact, the only muscle group that it does not directly target is the chest. Although the costal head of pec major in the lower chest does extend the arm, and one could argue that the pecs stabilize the shoulder muscle through the exercise, but I couldn't just say the deadlift works the entire body and be done with it now, could I? Now, if you wanna know how to integrate the deadlift and all of its variations into a comprehensive workout plan, I'm only a couple months away from finishing the full body version of my hypertrophy series resistance training programs, which has been in development for over three years. As soon as it is finished, I will put a link in the video description below. However, until that point, there will be a link in the video description you can use to add your name to a waitlist to beta test this program before it is finished 
in return for 50% off. Guys, if you liked this video, please show your support by hitting that like button and letting me know what you liked in the comment section below. Both of those things help tell the YouTube algorithm that this video is worth recommending. And if you want more top tier science-based fitness content, I highly recommend subscribing to Fitness Tip Friday, my free email newsletter that is always short, significant, and science-based, bringing a huge amount of value to you in a bite-sized package once a week that has become one of the most popular things that I do. But until then, mahalo my friends, see you next time.